Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to my Monday rant. You know, I was out at the company picnic with Where's Wally the other day. You know, the government Nazi Jew penguin picnic where they reward all of us shills for doing a good job every year, suppressing the flat earth. And he brought this post to my attention. Now this post is from well-known seventh grade science failure, Sleeping Warrior. And I believe that it refers to the fact that I was talking about sextants the other day, and I said that refraction does cause some slight bending of the light, but the error induced is small enough that I wasn't concerned about it. He seems to think that that is some sort of a fatal admission on my part, which speaks more to his misunderstanding of science and how it works more than any error on my part. But I thought it would be good to talk about the concept of when is good enough good enough? So let's cue up the music and see where this goes. Now my father, who was a mechanical engineer, had a friend in college who married a girl from Austria. And he had the opportunity to meet this girl's father once. And her father was a very formal gentleman who insisted on being called Herr Ing, which in German basically is the familiar form of Mr. Engineer. Now this gentleman's claim to fame was the fact that he helped design this thing. This is the German Tiger I tank, one of the better tanks in World War II. It was heavily armored and it had literally a world-beating gun on it, a variation of the German 88mm flak cannon. It was just a marvel of Teutonic engineering. However, it was extremely expensive. It was very labor-intensive and required rare materials. The road wheels had a nasty habit of binding up in snow and ice. And at a time that the Germans were struggling with petroleum products, its fuel consumption not only hurt, it severely limited its range. Now, it was said that a Tiger tank could beat 10 Shermans in a fair fight. And that very well may be true, except for two things. One, we didn't fight fair. We tended to ambush them. And two, we brought 11 tanks. Fewer than 2,000 Tiger I and Tiger II tanks were built during World War II. The United States built 50,000 M4 Shermans, and that was just us. And that's not even counting all the T-34s that the Soviets had. And the military guy in me thinks that they may have been better served by putting out 100 go-karts with an 88 on them than taking the time to build one Tiger tank. But that's just me. The point that I'm making is that when you're designing things and when you're doing science, for that matter, you have to strike a balance between modern engineering and practicality. That was the basis of my statement when it comes to dealing with refraction in the sextant, that yes, there is a slight error in it, but it's not enough to be of concern. Let me go ahead and show you exactly what I'm talking about. Now let's just review the use of a sextant real quick. The way a sextant works is that it measures an angle from a calculated horizontal to a star or another celestial object. In order to do that, it measures the angle between the star and the visible horizon. Now the point is that both these lines, these measurements, are not straight lines. They're slightly curved due to refraction. The question becomes is, is that curve due to refraction significant? Now if you listen to the flat earthers, They'll say, oh, you can't get an angle from anything other than a straight line. Well, sure you can. You can get an angle to a curved line. You're going to have a little bit of an error in it. I acknowledge that, and quite frankly, I'm okay with it. Because the error is so small that it doesn't make any practical difference. Now, the basis of them trying to raise questions about our understanding of refraction and the effect that a refraction would have on a sextant reading stems from this nonsense, the infamous flat earth black swan photo of platform habitat. Now the science denial argument goes that if you claim that a refraction would change this as much as it does, how can you possibly rely on the readings of a sextant? Well, let's go ahead and have a look at this because they obviously never did. Now, first of all, we have to acknowledge one thing. They've never actually analyzed this picture. 
But there are a couple of strange things in the photograph that you need to really have a much better understanding of refraction than most of the science denial community does in order to properly interpret. First of all, where's the horizon in that picture? In reality, the horizon is between the beach and that distant platform. Now, I know that you can see a horizon behind the platform, but that is a false horizon. The way that you can tell that there's an actual horizon there is the fact that there is part of that platform missing. Specifically, there's some 20 feet of that platform missing. And I've analyzed that with my guest Brandon Toy a couple of months ago. I'll stick a link to the uh, video of that in the description. Now, a normal refraction day is seen on the right and you can see that there is considerably more of that platform hidden by the horizon. But even on the severely refracted day, 20 feet of that platform is missing. Now let's go ahead and have a look at a couple of the numbers. First of all, the photograph was reportedly taken from an observer height of one foot over sea level. I don't have anything to disagree with that, so let's go ahead and go with it for right now. So we've got a one foot elevation. Now on the globe Earth, the distance from the beach to the platform is 9.41 statute miles. I have no idea how far it is on the flat Earth because all you ever see is the globe Earth calculation. If they really want to make a case for this, they should calculate how far that would be on a flat Earth and show how they got it. But they're a little math challenge, so what they do is they try and claim that the Earth is flat, yet use great circle distances for the, all their distances. And I always found it humorous that people that claim the Earth was flat would use spherical Earth distances to their objects that supposedly are too far to be seen. But that's neither here nor there. If you go to Walter Bislin's Advanced Earth Curve Calculator, we've used it many times. I'll stick a link to it in the description. If you put in a zero refraction day using 9.41 miles and one foot of observer height, you'll find that there's 44 feet hidden and the angle to the horizon is 0 0.0177 degrees. On a standard refraction day, you have 36 feet hidden and 0 0.0161 degrees down to the horizon. You see it's a little higher. Now on a severely refracted day, like from the black swan image, where only 20 feet is hidden, if you find out what a level of refraction is required to make 20 feet hidden, the angle to the horizon is 0 0.0125 degrees. Well, what's the difference between that angle to the horizon and that angle to the horizon? Because as you recall, part of our measurement on a sextant is the angle down to the horizon. Obviously, refraction would change that a little bit. Well, going from no refraction to severe refraction, how much will that change your position on Earth? 0 0.312 nautical miles. About a third of a mile. What's the accuracy of a sextant? In the hands of an expert, you can get down to about a tenth of a nautical mile. In the hands of a talented amateur like me, two nautical miles is pretty good. That's well below it. Next question. How much does a zero refraction geometric horizon make compared to a normally refracted horizon? It changes your position on Earth by 57 feet. I can live with that. Now something that we talked about a little bit is small angle approximation. Now the small angle approximation in science says that for small angles, the sine and the tangent equal the angle in radians. Now to test that out, we can actually find the values for a number of different angles. Now, say we have the Earth here with a radius of 3,440 nautical miles. The distance across the ground for 15 degrees, if angle alpha is 15 degrees, would be 900 nautical miles. If we calculate it by radians, it's 900.58, and if we just take the sine, it's 890.34. Again, at most 10 miles off, over 900 miles. You can see the numbers here for 10 degrees. Again, we're getting closer. Five degrees, getting very close. And by the time you get down to one degree or less, it's almost indistinguishable. Now, is it exact? No. Does it need to be? No. This is what's known as being good enough. This works 
and gives us practical answers. The question is, is how are you going to tell that difference? Do you have any idea how far that actually is in feet? You know, just to give you an idea, the larger of the two right here, the one that's the most off, is off by about 280 feet. I can deal with that. Now, you see this in the science denial community quite a bit. Uh, you'll see that with, for example, vaccinations. I'm not going to get vaccinated because you could get vaccinated and still get COVID. Well, yes, you could. We're going to talk about that in depth a little bit later. Not only are your chances of getting COVID much greater if you're not vaccinated, your chances of dying or even getting long-term effects of the disease are so much higher than any risk that you would have with a vaccination. It just doesn't make sense not to get vaccinated. But again, we'll talk about that and the risks later on in the week. You know, but this is such a common argument I had to address it. Yes, you know, if you get right down to it, yes, banks still get robbed. That doesn't mean that we shouldn't have laws against bank robbery or have people in prison for robbing banks. Now, in the final example, let's take one that we did earlier, and that is the distance between London and Bristol in the UK. Here are the coordinates for both cities. On the flat earth, here's the triangle that you would have to set up to find the distance between those two locations on a flat earth, on a flat plane of 99.24 nautical miles. The Haverson formula says the distance between those two longitude and latitudes is 92 miles. The actual Google Earth distance is 92.3 two nautical miles. Now, do these numbers have to exactly match? No, because we have some error in this number. That number assumes a perfectly spherical Earth, whereas the actual Earth is an oblate spheroid. That changes it very slightly. But you know, it's good enough to tell that that better represents the shape of the Earth than that does. In fact, it effectively rules out the possibility that the Earth could be flat. Because if the Earth was flat, it would be just over 99 miles to Bristol from London, where in reality, on a curved surface of a spherical Earth, it's only 92. So in a perfect world, the math would work out perfectly. But in the real world, there are confounding factors. Refraction, the oblate spheroid rather than a perfect spheroid. These change it just slightly and induce a slight amount of error by making assumptions that the Earth is perfectly spherical or taking shortcuts such as the small angle approximation. It's close enough to be useful. It's close enough to give us an answer as to whether the Earth is flat or spherical shaped. So, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Always strive for absolute precision, but understand when close enough is close enough. Take care, guys.